Hi, I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. I'm here today with Brian Sartin, SVP and Chief Services Officer, and Mark Sangster, Principal Evangelist and VP of Industry Security Strategies at eSend Hire, a cybersecurity company with employees around the world, customers in 60 countries, and a nearly 100% customer retention track record. To learn more about eSend Hire, visit eSendHire.com. Mark, Brian, welcome. Great to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, good to be here. So, Mark, you don't need much of an introduction. Most of the people in our industry know you. Um, They've read your book. If they haven't read No Safe Harbor, then I think they really ought to. Great book. I've read it. Uh, You've given a lot of talks in the industry. Uh, We've seen you in WSJ, Forbes, Wired, CSO. So tell us exactly what you do for eCentire. I'm the Vice President of Industry Security Strategies and Chief Advocate. And what that means is I spend a lot of times or a lot of my time with our clients understanding the challenges that they face that are specific and unique to their industries so that we can come with a very tailored, pivoted approach to what they do to protect what matters. And typically that's their assets, their people and their clients. So eCentire is trending in the industry. Uh, The company has a great brand, but I'm not sure that everybody knows just how many uh, employees you have, offices, customers, socks, threat hunting expertise globally. Um, I know that you're spread across the world now. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that and anything else you think people should know about the company. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The company was founded about 20 years ago, and we primarily worked in the financial industries um, sector, right? So things like alternative investments and hedge funds and investment banks and so on. Um, And what we really recognized at the time was that the services that were available, the technology and the way that those technologies were glued together really just didn't cut it, right? In those types of industries, they could be 100% compliant to the uh, the regulators to whom they're beholden, yet also be 100% owned by those criminals. Now, that was back in the day when we had 30 employees. Today, we're over 500 employees with over 1,000 clients, I think, in 70 different countries. We have multiple security operations centers, one in North America, um, one in Europe. And 24-7, those security operations centers are staffed by experts who are constantly hunting for threats. And when they find something suspicious, they dig in, they investigate, and where necessary, they contain it before it becomes business disrupting. So, Brian, I'm uh, curious about, you know, your move to the company. Uh, you have a great background. You joined uh, earlier this year, I believe, uh, you came to eCentire. And before that, uh, you headed up, you were the executive director for global security services at Verizon Enterprise Solutions. Mm-hmm. What was it that attracted you to eCentire? Because you certainly could, could have explored many opportunities in the industry. Oh, well, thank you. Um, actually, it's pretty easy. I mean, uh, the technology... What the company does, the core platform operations around Atlas, those interactions with their customers, how far that technology and the people, the services combination wrapped around that technology is able to pursue incidents so far and deep into the incident life cycle. The technology foundation is stellar, but you mix in the leadership team and some of the personalities that are here, very seasoned individuals that have been there and done it before. And uh, and with that, the culture, the culture here is really unique. And that's you put those three things together, in my mind, the ingredients are right for big success. And one of the areas that I'm focused on is adding critical mass on the services side around that core platform, sort of the uh, extending the customer experience, if you will. And, and within consulting and advisory services in particular, those are some of the areas I'm focused the most on at the moment. Um, I really, the greatest opportunity I see to sort of capitalize on those ingredients, it's around cyber investigations and incident response. So, Mark, we track the uh, market very closely. Uh, we're concerned about a number of uh, industries that have been targeted. They've been victims of cyber attacks and data breaches. Uh, four in particular would be legal, manufacturing, financial services, healthcare. Are those uh, industries that eCentire is focused on and exactly why? Yeah, absolutely. Those industries are core to our portfolio. And of course, the financial services one, I think, is, I think most people think self-evident, right? You know, people rob banks because that's where the money is, the old Willie Sutton um, 
quote or misquote. But the reality in that is, is that now in a digital world, right, these assets aren't just contained to currencies. Currencies now different things. And so in other industries, things like legal services, for example, so law firms, law firms have an unparalleled access to information from all swatches of our economy and the government um, and the regulators and so on. And because of that, they represent a kind of a one-stop shop for criminals. And through the social socialization of their targets, they recognize them as lucrative. And they're now building tools and technology and phishing lures and so on that they can use to ensnare those organizations that they now see as highly profitable. Manufacturing has also come onto the radar of recent for two different reasons. Either the intellectual property can be stolen to gain some kind of geopolitical advantage, right? The sort of the, it's called the, the, the James Bond or the Jason born kind of approach. But more realistically, on a day-to-day -day basis, they just fall victim to ransomware. So these organizations, they are now interconnected. They have what they call IR 4.0 or the Industrial Revolution 4.0, where everything is, is effectively virtual, right? It's, it's, it's IoT-based. And because of that, that increases the, uh, the threat landscape or the, the threat profile that criminals can use to target them. And when they do, they shut them down. They use ransomware now to create massive outages looking for seven-figure extortion payments. And we see the same thing in healthcare, which of course became very critical last year as we went through the pandemic. And it's the same thing again. Those medical records are very lucrative. They're worth stealing. They have value on the dark web. But conversely, shutting down those institutions where they know they're life-saving and doing so can be life-threatening means that these institutions are likely to pay the ransoms when they do uh, when they do face a massive outage. And that's where we come in. We protect them. Like I said, our job here is to contain these threats, identify them, investigate them, and stop them before they become business disrupting. Yeah, well, we're living through a very scary time right now, and it's certainly not just a pandemic. You touched on the healthcare space. We've actually seen a loss of lives, uh, and it's scary. We're watching oncology equipment uh, being shut down as a result of ransomware attacks. Let me turn to you, Brian, and ask for the industries that Mark just touched on. How important is it for a company like yours to have people with domain experience in those verticals? And tell us a little bit about eCentire and uh, the type of people you have and maybe the type of people you're looking for. Yeah, well, is it important to have um, uh, individuals uh, in service delivery, customer service and sales, all the elements of the business that touch uh, the customer directly, absolutely. Having the right industry expertise, experience, and things like that, absolutely critical. But when you look at what we're building out around advisory services, and especially in cyber investigations, it takes a combination of different types of backgrounds. And I'm a big believer in formulating the right teams. And by that, um, uh, folks with law enforcement backgrounds bring a certain case management hygiene to bear. They understand how to handle evidence. They understand terminologies, how to define, how to classify and track certain kinds of uh, uh, incidents and threats. Uh, folks from military and military intelligence types of backgrounds versus somebody who, for example, comes from systems engineering type of a uh, uh, type of a background and has that kind of ability to build, engineer, and design whatever you need technology or solution-wise for that particular moment. And you, you, you mix in a, a healthy dose of those with sort of an institutional IT background. It takes a combination of those backgrounds to deploy very, very effectively and build the right teams that'll scale in cyber investigations from very small ransomware type situations all the way out to the largest, most volatile you know, cross-border data breaches. So Mark, in our industry, what repeatedly happens is somebody coins a phrase, Time goes on, everybody adopts that phrase, and, you know, vendors are all, you know, reading from the same playbook, but I don't think really, you know, insofar as what the companies do, uh, you know, often highly differentiated from each other. So talk to us about managed risk, MDR, DFER, but in the context of exactly what eCentire does and how you're differentiated in the market. Yeah, absolutely. And you're so right. Managed detection and response when uh, I think the category was co coined five, six years ago, there's, I think, 14 companies listed in the reports. And now there's, you know, hundreds, mm -hmm. right? And and there's certainly all sorts of different flavors or how they go about trying to, you know, slice and dice and solve the problem. Now, we are really the authority in managed detection and response. And it's threat hunting done right, right? On a 24-7 basis, we know that adversaries don't work nine to five. They don't work in the same time zones, that we have to be constantly vigilant. 
for that over 20 year period, like I said, we've been hunting those threats. Now, part of the MDR service is the collection of signals. And, and you know, that's looking at things like endpoints and cloud services and, and logs and so on. But the entire industry, uh, I, I think, to some degree, has over-rotated on detection, right? So they sort of see this as, if I create an alert, I've done my job. Well, in my mind, alerting is just part of detection. It is not part of managed detection response. It's not the latter part. The latter part is the hard piece. And that's where we've invested heavily in our XDR uh, cloud-based Atlas platform. That effectively allows us to aggregate all those signals, to correlate them. And then we use the multiple patents that we have in machine learning to go through, to filter, to digest. So what we see often and often with criminals is that they're using hands-on keyboard types of tactics. They're using our own credentials that have been stolen. They're using remote administrative tools to gain access to your environment. So much of what they do looks like legitimate traffic. However, at the microscopic level, this is where the ML um, algorithms come in because they can detect the subtle differences that indicate something that's a threat. That's when it gets kicked up to our security experts. They take that telemetry, they take that packaged investigation information, and they go that last mile where they determine whether or not it truly is a threat. Is it malicious? Is it benign? In the cases where it's a threat, they then take action to respond, to contain that, to block traffic, isolate devices, whatever it takes. So our MDR service really is about three R's here, right? It's response, remediation, and results. Now on the managed risk side, that's the advisory services that Brian was talking about. So this is sort of the beginning or the end of the life cycle when it comes to cyber risk. Because at the end of the day, cyber risks are gonna go on, right? There's no way to end the threats that we face from the various criminals, whether they're organized crime or state sponsored. So those are the types of services that do the risk assessments, that determine, as Brian said, when we looked at the various industries, what regulators do you have to deal with? What other guardrails do you have? What kind of assets have you got? And what are the ways that the criminals go after those assets to steal them? So we help them craft that. We help them put policies and procedures and security programs in place. And of course, if you build a program, you have to be able to test it. And that's also critical. So we have lots of services there that provide the risk assessments, vulnerability assessments, pen testing, and so on. And then also the other pieces of it, the, the war gaming and the planning. So incident response planning, uh, um, red team, blue teams exercises, those sorts of things. And that really feeds the new services, the digital forensics and incident response services. And while to some degree they may feel like they conflict, they don't, because the reality is in situations like that, and we have faced this, we have uncovered numerous zero days. We have gone toe to toe multiple times now with nation states, and we know there's times where we have stopped and contained, but that's the triage. And now we have to determine what we have to do after this. Are there reporting requirements? What information do we potentially want to turn over to law enforcement? And if that's the case, we need experts like Brian was talking about, the ones that understand how to investigate, to go into the crime scene and not trot all over it, to collect the information, to keep it within a chain of custody so it's preserved, it's authentic, and it can be presented in a court if that's necessary. So Brian, Ecentire is constantly innovating. I want to ask you about their new defer capability with four-hour remote threat suppression globally. I just heard about it. Uh, tell us uh, what the company's doing. Well, yeah, um, just a, a little bit of background on on what we're doing around um, uh, cyber investigations and some of the capabilities launch. I um, I have been in the in the industry for a long time, you know, and um, uh, in the IR space specifically, had a lot of success there through the years. And what I've I've started to notice is that uh, a lot of the leaders in the space, you look at the you know the the three or the five uh, recognized global. IR leaders today. I mean, they're still using a lot of technologies and a lot of approaches that, you know, we're going back to say 2005. There's like 15 year old stuff happening as far as service delivery. And you look at customer experience, IR as it happens by and large today is too costly. It's too fumbly. It's got too many moving parts and it's too slow moving. It's too slow to get off the starting blocks. And I think if there's one area where we have really set out to be disruptive and to make a difference, uh, especially around customer experience. It's just that. I think with the right forward-leaning, people-powered approaches wrapped around the right technologies, we have a certain ability 
not just to be faster off the starting blocks, to have faster time to execution, but ultimately lead to faster time to value. And that certainly means lower cost and a number of other uh, advantages for uh, for the end customer. And that's exactly what we set out to do. And I think there's no better example of where disruption is needed around incident response than looking at you know the top three service providers in the world today. The best they do is, by and large, the best they were able to do as far as response times back in 2005. And it's anywhere in the world in 24 hours, boots on the ground. So we're doing that as well, but we're taking it a step better. So we're doing anywhere in the world in four hour threat suppression backed by strong service level agreement. Much of uh, incident response and cyber investigations type activity, irrespective of whether it's an external breach crossing the internet, targeting an edge network or uh, an inside situation, something developing in a cloud tenant or you know something involving uh, ideologically uh, motivated um, you know disruption type activities or what have you, irrespective of the type of breach. With the, today's technology and today's approaches, um, much of those investigative activities, as far as determining the source and origins and avenues of intrusion, uh, containing the situation, ensuring no possibility for continued loss, determining the extent of informational losses, and like some of the items that Mark said, setting the stage for, say, prosecution, litigation, or, or long-term dispute resolution, most, most of that can be done very, very effectively and securely remotely these days. So I think we've got a capability and a nice two-tier service delivery model that's going to enable us to break the glass, if you will, and push the edge of the envelope in the industry and start driving incident response backed by service level agreement far more effectively and quickly out in the marketplace than what you see in the conventional model and approach today. So, Mark, I'd like to get an idea from you around how you work directly uh, with CISOs. Uh, you know, we talk to a lot of them from Fortune 500, Global 2000 companies, and, you know, they come on and some of them want to talk to us about compliance. Others, it, you know, it's risk management, digital transformation. There, uh -huh. there are some who are talking to us about 24 by 7 threat hunting. Of course, now, you know, everybody's grappling with uh, supporting a remote workforce you know, how, how, how do they prioritize? How do you help them, you know, prioritize across so many different initiatives? Is that part of what eCentire does, you know, consulting and advisory at that level? Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it varies to some degree, partly, I think, on the sophistication of, of the client base. As you said, if you're working with a Fortune 500 company that has a much larger team with a lot of resources, there may be specific asks that they have. Now, in the smaller mid-sized type of industries, it's different. And that's where, in those cases, um, they are looking for that kind of consultative service where we can help them craft policy, help them communicate, um, and balance their risk. And when I think of risk, there's three broad categories that I see. There's the sophisticated threats that we face. And unfortunately, that's where we tend to focus. But we ignore partly what you alluded to, which is new adoption of technology or emerging technology, right? Where we don't understand it as well. And I talked about manufacturing and that interconnected um, factory floor, right? IR 4.0. That's a prime example. You have what we call operational technology people, right? The engineers or the doctors on a, in a hospital ward who understand how to apply the tech for a specific outcome, whether that's, you know, building whatever it might be, cars, or whether that's treating patients. But they don't understand that first piece, the cyber risks, right, from the sophisticated threat actors. And then the third piece of that, of course, is the accountability piece, right? And that's that used to be in terms, I think, of just regulators, but now it's not. Now it's about the SLAs that they might have within their own supply chain, right? It may be patient care SLAs or contractual obligations that they have. Think about a law firm, for example, that's supporting a healthcare institution or a financial institution that has specific requirements based on their regulated industry. And it's pulling all of those together. And it, you know, we, we can't, uh, I, I can't say that there's a, a one size fits all. Because at the end of the day, it really does come down to that company. And part of that advisory services is building out their risk requirements, right? So what are the top risks they face? How do we prioritize those? And then how do we help put that program in place? And, and I'd actually say if there's a number one ask that we have, it's actually about communication and championing cybersecurity. So what I mean by that is when they go to their boards or they're going to their C-suite, they're looking for us to help build the narrative, to provide the information that they need to make a compelling business case for the service. 
So I want to ask both of you the same question because it's so important and I don't think we could ask it enough. Uh, and I'll start with you, Brian. We're uh, you know, well past a year now into the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. How much of an impact has that had on CISOs, on security teams? And in your opinion, are we in the new norm? Are we going to see you know, remote workforces as a big ongoing issue, or is this more of a moment in time and you think things will uh, return to the way they used to be at some point soon? Yeah, I, I would say it's 50% um, uh, the new norm and 50% um, a moment in time. I think that as we all transition out of the COVID lockdown and restrictions and so forth, I think uh, if there's a perception in many people's minds that business is going to go back to the way it was, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that the edge network has now clearly moved uh, permanently into the employee's home. The tendency to consolidate resources inside traditional networks and server rooms and data centers, I think that's by and large gone. I think the, the sort of expedited cloud adoption that you've seen under uh, under COVID, that is a trend that is here to stay and likely exacerbate over time. The network has has changed in some cases dramatically uh, during COVID. That means the network you have to protect and the security required to protect it, that's all changed. That also means the way we provide services have changed dramatically. And that's one of the reasons why um, uh, the ability to have the right technology, the right services mix, and to be able to securely, reliably, and repeatedly drive services into the enterprise securely and remotely is such a big component of our engagement model these days. Certainly a centerpiece to what we have around cyber investigations. So, Mark, let me throw it over to you, and, and I'd certainly like to uh, hear your viewpoint on just how difficult it's been for the CISOs and security teams during this time. So for the companies that already had a strong remote workforce and knew how to deal with remote workers, uh, this was business as usual. But we certainly saw a contingency, particularly on the smaller side, where they were coming and saying, look, now we realize they're outside of our traditional perimeter. They're outside of our firewall. What do we do? Right. So they were looking at things like um, endpoint services, as an example, how to secure remote, remote access and whether or not that remote access into their traditional environment uh, brought with it threats, right? So we all recognize that with um, home routers that weren't uh, protected, that probably had default uh, administrative credentials still on them, and they, you know, they hadn't encrypted their Wi-Fi and all those sorts of challenges that we saw early days. Um, now, most of the CISOs have, have pivoted. And I think the big lesson we can get out of this is whether this is, you know, the new normal or a moment in time, because I agree with Brian, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, the reality is it wasn't the first time and it certainly won't be the last. And I use as an example um, the attacks we saw on 9-11, right? That that changed our viewpoint of security and continuity and having systems that were co-located outside of our traditional um, foundation. And then, of course, you know, a, what a decade later, Hurricane Sandy rolled through New York. And what did we see? We now realize that putting backups across the Hudson River wasn't far enough, right? And that changed a lot of the rules. And there was a lot of court precedent around that. And now with COVID, we see the shift to remote workers. So the reality is we have remote workers, we have distributed uh, workloads, and we also have assets that are in the cloud. It's kind of our new form of virtual reality. So as I say, the key takeaway we can learn from this is that it wasn't the first time and it won't be the last time we see transition and shift in the digital world. Well, it was great having the two of you with us, uh, learning more about eCentire and what the uh, thought leadership uh, has to say. Talk to us before you leave about the future. What uh, What's coming from eCentire uh, the later half of this year, next year, and down the line? Yeah, you know, I, I, I won't talk to Roadmap. I'm going to leave those surprises. But what I will say is that we know the threats, the sophisticated actors we see, they're constantly adapting, they're constantly changing. And the one thing that I see from our security operations center really is unparalleled results when it comes to digging these things out, right? And and I think with our DFIRST services that we're going to see even more of that, right? It's going to allow us to take what we've learned in those incidences, reverse engineer them, and create a very clear, simplistic framework that those organizations can use to protect themselves. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. I hope you'll come back on. Yeah, absolutely. It's been Thanks a pleasure. I am Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. Joining us today was Brian Sartin, 
SVP and Client Services Officer, and Mark Sangster, Principal Evangelist and VP of Industry Security Strategies at eCentire, a cybersecurity company with employees around the world, customers in 60 countries, and a nearly 100% customer retention track record. To learn more about eCentire, visit eCentire.com. You can keep up with all of our media at cybercrimemagazine.com.